Good afternoon, everyone. It is great to be back again. You don't get a, get a chance to get over here often enough, and a lot of friends over here too. And it's, it's great. Connie, my wife, said to give everybody a hello, and those that uh, would to give them a hug. And she would, would always like to be here. But we went to, we were in Kalamazoo this morning. She had a rough week. Uh, just felt like she needed to actually rest on the Sabbath instead of come here for a second service. So, so she is home resting. We uh, we just got our power back on this morning sometime. So we we were living off a generator and experiencing it like the old days. I think one of the kids said in Kalamazoo, you know, with no no TV and no internet and nothing to do at night except talk to each other or something. It was just so wild. It was it was interesting because you get used to used to things that, that you you just didn't we just didn't have so. But again, it is great to great to be here. Great to see everybody. A lot of people. Everybody it seemed like was able to make it out. So one of the ways that Christ got the attention of the people and the leaders was to say things that went against conventional thought. Say things that say things in a way that people weren't expecting. You can't. I don't know that I would call them shocking, but they would be thought provoking, because it wasn't the way they would necessarily always think about whatever subject he chose. You know, he said things like, "If you want eternal life, you have to be born again." He gave examples where the hero of the story wasn't the Pharisee or the Sadducee, but it was the tax collector or the Samaritan. He took a person who was caught in sin, who was on the verge of losing their life, and rather than give out the punishment that the law required, he told the people, why don't you look around and look at yourself, and whoever doesn't have sin, begin the process of stoning this person. He liked to make people think about their preconceived notions, I think, in some ways, is what he, was, what he was attacking. And in a similar vein, he said that if you were an adult, if you were a true Christian adult, you need to learn to act more like a child. Now, he didn't say it exactly in those words, but he said it to make the point that adults lose some part of their character as they grow up. Something that they should try and, and recognize that they need to recapture. There are lessons that he pointed out that small children can teach us. Lessons that we should relearn on how to approach life, how to approach the way we look at things, how, do we, how to approach the, our relationship with our family and with our parents. And those lessons are what we're going to talk about today. What the, lesson, what the Bible says that we should learn from as we observe little children. How we should apply those lessons in our life. So we'll look at the question, what does it mean to have a childlike attitude? I suppose I have to address naysayers. <laughs> to begin with, because as we go through this message, we'll, we'll say, little children think like this. Little children do this. And any of us that have had little children could say, well, my child doesn't do that or doesn't always do that. And that's true. We're talking in, in generalities. We're talking about um, how most little children act in a certain situation or under certain conditions. And that's the way that Christ approached that, too. He, he never said, take a look at a child and just do everything the way that they do and look at the world just like they do. He, was, he said there are certain characteristics that we've lo we lose as adults that we need to recapture. And I think when you look at your children, certainly if you have little children, sometimes... It's good to step back because you see them every day and you say, well, my little brat doesn't do any of these things or he's not that way. 
uh, and recognize that, yes, if you step back, there are all these childlike qualities are there. They aren't always expressed the way you'd like them to be, but, but they are a part of little children. As Mr. Joseph said, little children are precious to God. But what really what we're going to look at in this message is that God sees us also as little children, and we are precious to God when we react to him and respond to him like little children as well. It's part of the reason we're precious to him. This idea that adults need to become childlike isn't something that Christ just said was nice to do. If you get some time, why don't you think about looking at little children and mirroring the good qualities of them Christ said that that attitude within us is important for our spiritual well-being, critical for us to end up where we all want to end up within God's family. When Christ talks about us becoming as little children, in essence, he's talking about our relationship with the Father, what that should be like, how we should look at him. And again, warning us that we've lost some perspective. As adults, it's easy to become cynical and negative and pessimistic and let those qualities be the ones that rule the way that we look at the world and sometimes allow those qualities to bleed over into our relationship with God. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. Chapter 18, we'll begin reading in verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Christ and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Christ called a little child over to him, sat him down in the midst of the disciples, and he said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted, unless you change who you are, and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. So again, not just a nice-to-do thing, but a recognition that if a childlike attitude isn't part of our relationship with our Father, isn't the way that we become, it could prevent us from becoming part of God's kingdom. So this is an important concept, something that we do need to think about and make sure that we aren't forgetting about. We, that we aren't losing that attitude as well. And he, he said, unless you are converted, unless you change yourself. And I certainly want all of us to think about these attitudes, these characteristics that we'll talk about today. It's perfect time as we approach the, the spring holy days to ask ourselves, do I have this attitude? Do, are these aspects of my relationship with God strong and vital? Or are, are these something along with other things that God shows us that I should be working on during this time? Verse 4 continues with Christ's thought. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And this really is, is the first characteristic, the first quality that we're going to look at if we're going to recapture a childlike attitude is that we need to make sure we are truly humble. Humble in the same way that a young child is humble. When we look at this example, we see certain aspects of, the, of a little child that Christ had to be pointing to as he pulled that little child there, set him down, and then talked to the disciples. He talked about being humble, but as you can see, the little child was also completely self, he lacked self-consciousness. He wasn't afraid of people looking at him, of being put on the spotlight and having people examine, look at him. Most of us shy away from that. We don't want people to look too closely at us because we believe that we'll be will be judged harshly. And it, it, 
and again, it's, it's an example of how God looks at us. God looks at us and, and just sees that little child. Like we do, when we look at a little child playing, sitting there, you know, the, the little child obviously was just being a little child sitting down there that Christ was pointing to. And that's how God sees us. And that it puts a smile on his face. And most of the time, if you just see a little child playing, it's, it's something that's, that brings joy. And it's the way God looks at us. Little children aren't concerned about what other people are thinking of them. Little children aren't generally focused on what their hair is like, whether their clothes match. Physical appearance little child, again, is, is not self-conscious about those things. That isn't what their life is about. And when, when you couple that with humility, we st you start to see the physical side of our life isn't something that should have that much value, that should bring a lot of worry to our life, that we should hold as overly important. Those aren't the things that God looks to. Those aren't the things that God wants us to hold as important. Young children don't look around at other babies and see how they stack up, how they measure up against the other little babies. They aren't comparing. They aren't looking to see whose parents have the most money. Again, it's a young child doesn't have that strong tie to and, and measuring against physical things. I think that you could say that this type of humility that Christ is talking about as, as he has everyone look at that little child means living in the moment. Just enjoying being in the presence. Enjoying the people around you simply because they're there. Making the most of your experiences without allowing unimportant things to intrude. So Christ begins this idea of becoming childlike, tying it to humility. And that lack of self-consciousness, that lack of worrying about physical things. Let's turn to, Ch to Luke. This is not a parallel scripture, but it talks about a similar, there's a similar message that Christ gives in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, we'll begin reading in verse 9. And then Christ spoke this parable to those who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous, and looked down on other people. Christ said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and one a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood, and he prayed this way to himself. I've always thought that there's a little dig there that his prayer was only to himself, not to God. He wasn't, God wasn't listening to this prayer because of the attitude of the Pharisee. The Pharisee said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner or unjust or an adulterer. I'm not even like this tax collector over here. I, which was the word that got Satan in trouble, <laughs> I. And he says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing far off didn't even or didn't, couldn't even raise his eyes to heaven, but he struck himself and he said, God, please be merciful with me, a sinner. And Christ then said and summed it up and said, I tell you, the man, this man went back home justified, forgiven, rather than the other one. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Humility. Part of that childlike attitude. 
part of one of those things that we should look at, should examine ourselves, make sure that in all areas we're humble, that there's none of the example that Christ said, no comparison with other people in, in a way that makes you feel better about yourself, that makes you convince yourself you're more righteous because every one of us are sinners. Christ said that it's a mistake to look at someone else and say, I am so much better, so much more righteous because I do this and this and this and this. Let's continue reading in verse 15. But, then they, also, but they that also brought infants to him that he might touch them, lay his hands on them, when the disciples saw that people were doing this, they rebuked those people, but Christ said to him, let the little child, let the little children come to me. Don't forbid them. Don't block them. Because this little children, people who reflect the attitude of this little child, are what make up the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter into it. Again, a reinforcement of that idea. We need to make sure that we have and are maintaining this childlike attitude if we want to be part of God's family. I think to summarize this first point, this first quality we have to make sure we're seizing as part of a childlike attitude, is that God wants us to remember who our Father truly is. Remember that everything we've done, everything we have, everything we are, we owe to Him. That it's not us. That we don't owe it to ourselves. We're only righteous because Christ lives in us. We're not righteous within ourselves. Let's turn now to Proverbs chapter 10. We'll get into the next quality, childlike quality that we should be seeking. Proverbs chapter 10. And we're going to read verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son makes a glad father. Foolish son brings grief to his mother. A wise son brings joy. A foolish son brings grief. The second quality we have to have is we, need, we should be looking to please our parents to bring gladness rather than grief in our relationship. Why, what does the wise, wise child do? They do things that they know will make their parents happy. And just sort of a side point on this, but I do want you to think about it as we go through this, and I'll probably remind you of this. When we talk about this relationship, child to parent, parent to child, on a spiritual sense, we almost always talk about it between us and our father. Very rarely do we bring in the mother to the relationship. But the Bible tells us we have a mother, a spiritual mother as well. What is, who is that? The ecclesia, the church. When we look at some of these attitudes and qualities, we shouldn't, analyze ourselves just as how we relate to the Father, but because many of these have an aspect that relates to the body of Christ, the church, the ecclesia, the, the mother as well. It isn't just one parent that the Bible really says in these examples is important to have a good relationship with. Again, sort of a side point, but something that as we go through this, I'd certainly like you to think about from that aspect as well. Little children will go to great lengths to please their parents. They'll bring little things they find as gifts. 
because they know that it will put a smile on their parent's face. They'll sit down without being asked and draw a picture or make a card or make a note saying, I love you, I love whatever. Little children want to help their parents in whatever their parents are trying to do, to carry, to pick up, to cook, to work with, to work on the car. <laughs> they want to be involved in their parents' work, what their parents are doing. They want to help out. And as physical little children, we, we love it. It can be a little bit of an inconvenience sometimes. <laughs> but we love to see them want to be like us. And God is the same way. He loves it when we say, I want to be like you. I want to help. I want to do this along with while you're doing it as well. I want to pitch in. There's some very, very moving, touching songs that have been written about this idea of the children wanting to be or ending up being on the negative side like their parents because of the way their parents were, following that example. And as we work to become and we look at ourselves from this aspect of whether we have that childlike relationship, that's certainly one side that we should look at. How much do we want to be like God? How much do we want to help in whatever he's doing? How much time do we spend in that imitation, which is, you know, is an honor? Do we do that? Turn to Romans chapter 8. We'll begin reading in verse 7, Romans chapter 8. Because the carnal mind is emanated against God and isn't subject to the law of God, and it can't be, but uh, so then those who are in the flesh can't please God. If we want to please God, we have to weed out certain parts of our natural human nature. The carnality has to go. Again, it's certainly one of the areas that I, I look at this time of the year is where is my carnality showing the most right now? Where am I the farthest away from following the example that Christ set, that my father would want the way that my father would want me to live? Little children... You know, as it mentioned, being that the carnal mind fights against being subject to the law, to God's law. Little children, for the most part, again, don't have that immediate response of someone trying to control them. They, when the, when they're reared in a loving home and in general, they want to please. They'll follow the law. They'll, follow, they'll do the things that know, they know will make their parents happy. Turn now to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, we'll begin reading in verse 1. Therefore, laying aside malice and deceit and hypocrisy, envy and evil speaking, be like newborn babes. Be like a young child. Have a childlike attitude. Desire the pure milk of the word that you can grow. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, Envy, 
evil speaking, those are all adult things. Those are all the things that as ch people transition from a young child to adulthood, they pick up if they're going to. Those are not childlike attitudes. But desiring the pure milk of the word is something that young children do. Desiring that, that milk, desiring that sustenance. He said, Paul, Peter said, put aside carnality. Put aside carnality. In your prayers, how much time do you spend asking God, what can I do to please you? What can I do to make you happy? Show me what I can do to, to be childlike. Open my eyes. Help me to see. And, the same, and, and on, on the same vein, in your prayers, in your meditation, how much time do you spend saying, Dad, where can I help? What can I do for you? Where do you need me to spend my time and focus? What can we do together? Again, these are, these are childlike attitudes. And I think all of us, to some degree, and at different times in our life, lose some of that desire. And this is, this is a reminder for all of us that we shouldn't let that slip away. Do you find yourself arguing with God about what you want to believe and what you want to do and let, instead of just saying, help me to do what you want? Help me to follow your law? Is there ever a time where you resist what he's asked, he's telling us to do? Either resist his word, resist mom, resist the leadership that God has established. Generally not childlike if, you're, if you find yourself doing any of those things. So again, one of those characteristics is that a child like looks for ways to please their parent. A third way, a third childlike attitude is that they are, again, generally, but I will say they are honest and open. There's less of a desire to hide things. Turn to First John chapter one. First John chapter 1, we'll begin in verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we admit our sins, then our dad is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. If we say that we haven't sinned, then we are making him a liar, and his word is not in us. God's saying that he wants honesty in our relationship. And again, if you think about little, little kids, sure, they will mess up, they will make mistakes, and maybe they'll try to say no at first, but it doesn't take long before they'll start, they'll be bawling and saying, yes, I did, and I'm sorry, and I, I didn't mean to do it, and I, please forgive me. And, and there'll be that humble recognition, yeah, I did. But they also do that because they know that their parents love them. They know that their, ultimately all they want is a hug. They want, you, they want to be able to cry, and they want to be able to say, I, I messed up, and you to say it's okay. And that's what God says he does for us when we repent. He forgives. He said, if, if you say that you sin, I know you're lying, you know you're lying, why do you waste time 
with that. Just confess. Just recognize. Tell me that you did so that we can move on, so that you can be forgiven. You can take that off your conscience, and you can move on. And I think it was interesting we, that verse 10 ends chap, chapter 1, and, and chapter 2 starts out with John saying, my little children. Now, there's a number of reasons why he could have said that. Was he reminding them of what they should aspire to be, to be little children? Was he saying it because he looked at them as his children? Was he complimenting them and saying, you actually, I see a childlike attitude in you. I'm just reminding you of things. I don't know, whatever the coincidence is, but it's interesting that after talking about that relationship issue, and he says, he, he, he says, my little children. Little children are generally very honest and very open about what they say. Sometimes we have to teach them that there is time, a time for discretion. But they're generally, they'll say what's on their mind, they'll say what they believe is the truth, and they won't, they'll just be honest with what they're feeling, what they're going through, what they think. And God certainly wants us to be honest in our relationship with him and be open in the same way. To have that same openness where we know that we can and we do come to him and talk about everything, every problem, every fault, every battle, anything. Without thinking that there's some things that are just we just shouldn't talk about those things. He wants us to be open about our successes. He wants us to be open about our failures. And he wants us to, be, to talk about both of those, to share those with us. A childlike attitude would shares in our prayers, in our meditation, whenever we're talking to God. Share the successes, the things that went well. Share your failures, the things that didn't go so well. Ultimately, what God wants is that no barriers relationship that a young child has with their parent. Nothing getting in the way. And at the heart of that relationship, that no barriers relationship, is trust and confidence. To know that it's safe to tell our father anything, to come to him with anything. And honestly, if you, if there are those barriers, if there are things that you can think of right now that you don't talk to God about, then maybe the start of why is looking at your level of trust or your level of confidence in God's promises and what he says and the relationships that we're talking about here. Next, let's turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. Chapter 12, beginning in verse 9. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more readily respect the Father of spirits and live? For those physical fathers did, for a little while, correct us, as it seemed best to them. But our spiritual father corrects us in a way that is guaranteed to work, to bring good results. So that we can be partakers of his holiness. No chastening, verse 11, is joyful at the present time, but it, it's painful. But afterward, it does yield peace, the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have allowed themselves to be disciplined by it. I think sometimes we are afraid to come to God with things because we're afraid of the punishment. We're afraid of what's going to happen if we admit it. 
And what we find here is an example that tells us God will only treat you in a way that will bring good to you. Yes, there may be pain. But if there is pain, if there is pain that comes from God helping you with something, it's only going to be for your own good in the long run. Only going to be. There's never a time where God punishes where it just is for no reason, for no good outcome. And he knows more. It says here, our fathers disciplined us you know, the best way they knew how because in a way that they thought was the right way. And he says, God is completely different than that. God doesn't have to guess about how to punish us or what to, how, how to discipline us or how to teach us. He knows what's right for us. He knows what's best for us. And you can, it's a guarantee that as our father, he gives us what we need to grow and to, to move forward, not to stay locked in. There should not be hesitancy to go to God and talk about, uh, talk about anything, ask for forgiveness for anything. A childlike attitude doesn't have any hesitancy in that area. One more scripture in, toward this point is in Psalms 51. Psalms 51, beginning in verse 3. David, certainly an example for all of us in so many different areas of his life. He said, I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is there in front of me. I see it all the time. And I know that really that sin is, is against you and just against you. I've done this evil in your sight. You know about it. You already know about it. But I acknowledge my sins so that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. David wasn't afraid to tell God, to come before God, to talk to God. And David did some horrible things. David did some horrible things. And yet he didn't, he was not afraid to go to God and say, I messed up. Help me, help me move on from this. Again, that the third quality of a childlike attitude is honesty and openness. The fourth quality is that little children get excited about the simplest of things. They're not afraid to be excited about things. A simple gift, a little surprise, discovery of something that they didn't know before. Seeing something for the first time. They get excited about it. It doesn't take extravagance. It doesn't take big things to get them excited. All it takes is for their parent to play a game with them or to read them a book or take a walk somewhere, and they get excited about it. This fourth childlike attitude is that little children are excited to spend time with their parents. Little children are excited to spend time with their parents. We're going to turn to Romans 8. Romans 8 will begin in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. You did not receive the spirit of bondage to fear. You received the spirit of adoption, which, for, because of which we cry out, Abba, Father. And the Spirit itself bears witness that we are the children of God. 
And if we are the children of God, we are heirs. Heirs of God, heirs, joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, we will be glorified together as well. We are little children. Do we make excuses to spend time with our Father? Or do we make excuses to, stay, to not spend time? What happens more often in, in your life? What happens more often in my life? Do I pass up other things that I might be interested in to pray or study or meditate or fast more? Or do I spend make the choice to spend time in other things and shortchange those things that build that relationship with God? Which do you find yourself doing more often? I know the answer many times to that from my side of things. Are you excited to spend time with God? Like a little child is excited to spend time with their parents. We get excited about the Feast of Tabernacles, about what we look forward to, about the trip, about all the things that are aspects of that. On a spiritual level, the Sabbath pictures the exact same thing as the Feast of Tabernacles. Do we have anywhere near the same level of excitement every week as the Sabbath approaches when it's another time dedicated to spend, another time God has set aside dedicated to spending more time with him? Do we get excited for the Sabbath? Or do we collapse and, and just sleep during, on the Sabbath? Do we get excited about coming to church? Or do we see it as a duty? A command that we have to fulfill. The fourth childlike aspect is that little parents, or little parents, <laughs> oh, okay, little children love to spend time with their parents. The fifth one is that they trust their parents. They trust their parents. Turn to Psalms chapter 131. Psalms 131, we'll begin in verse 1. Lord, my heart is not haughty, my eyes aren't lofty, I don't concern myself with great matters, and I don't think, I don't get too wrapped up in things that are too profound for me. I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child. I have, be, David's recognizing as he's praying to God, at least in some areas of my life, I've become more childlike. It's almost like he's saying, I did this. I, I, I had some of these things before. There was a time where I was kind of full of myself. There was a time where I wanted to establish my kingdom. There was a time where I thought I could solve all the, all the, the great questions of life. Where I tried to figure out things that are, were just beyond me. But he says, but now... I've quieted my soul. I've calmed myself down, and I've become more like a weaned child, like a young child. I've got more of a childlike attitude. A weaned child with his mother, like a weaned wean child, is my soul within me. And then he says, hope in the Lord from this time forward. David recognized sometimes adults just overthink things, overcomplicate things, make things more difficult than they really have to be. And he, he recognized that he was like that, and he said, but because of God, I've changed some of those things. I've developed a different spirit, a better spirit. I've become more like that child. 
it wasn't just Christ who recognized the value of the, some of these childlike attributes that we're talking about. David recognized the value of them as well, and it's safe for us so that we can recognize those, those things of value as well. And David said, I rely on, I'm, I look to, like a wean child, I just, I rely on you. Or he says, like a wean child to, to, to his mother, I rely on you. I trust you. And, da- and the Psalms are filled with examples of David's trust in God. That that was part of their relationship. A trusting child isn't afraid. They're confident in their parents. That they'll protect them, that they'll help them, that they'll be with them, that, they'll, that they will be there for them. Who does a young child look for when they need support? Generally... Again, they look to their parents. Who do you look to when you need support? Are you looking to our parents when you need support? How many times when you think of the, the young children that you've had in your life, do you, have they, they taken a step or two out onto something? You know, maybe it's on a little beam or it's a little platform or something. Take a couple steps on their own. And then they realize, this is, I don't know that I can handle this. Dad, Mom, come and help me, steady me, get me through this. That's, that's trust. And that's what God wants us to do as well. I've got myself into something that I think is over my head here. I, think I, I don't think I can take care of this myself. God, please come and help me. Please walk with me. Please stand beside me. I need you to get me through this. How many times do we do that and how many times do we think, I can solve this myself. I can take care of this myself. I'm I'm an adult. (laughs) I can take care of this. Again, every one of us is different. But all questions that we should ask ourselves. Turn to chapter 23 of Psalms. This is a reflection of David's complete trust in God. And a familiar passage of scriptures one that it's probably, I think, easy to read over and forget about how the import behind, behind it, but I do want us to think about the trust that these, this chapter indicates David had for God and measure ourselves against that trust. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not want. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me to still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me. There's not any I <laughs> in here. There's a lot of he. God does these things. Not David does these things. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because he is with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Your the protection that I trust in. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Certainly describe how a Christian has to live in the society right now, I think. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life because you are with me. Is the implied reason David can say that. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Trust. When crunch time came, David, David had learned to turn to God. He knew where to place his trust. And again, I think we should all look back over the last several years and all of the things that we've gone through and ask ourselves, did I always place my trust in God? Or did I place my trust in other places from time to time? 
where was I truly trusting during so much of the upheaval that we've had over the last three years? Sixth aspect, a little child is loving. They just love. They, they just love. They, they exude love most of the time. They love to be held. They love to be hugged. They love to be, love, love to be close. They respond to their parents with love. They respond to their parents' love. And it's a love that really is childlike. Without reservation, without holding back, without thinking that it could go away, that their parents' love could go away. It's always, there's always that expectation. And when, you, when a child responds to you in love, it's almost impossible to not respond back the same way. And it's the same way with God. If you respond to him with love, that's how he responds back. That's what he gives back. Turn to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. We'll begin reading in verse 7. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God, is reflecting God, is a child of God, and knows God. He who does not love doesn't know God, for God is love. In this love of God was, in this the love of God was made clear to us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might have life through that son. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be that propitiation for our sins. God is love. He never tires of expressing love. It's the foundation of everything he's doing for mankind, everything he's doing with each one of us individually. It's what he commits to the relationship. And he would like us as children to reflect and respond back with that same, with love in the same way. Do you just say the simple phrase, I love you, God? I love you, God. I love this part of, about you. I love this part about you. I love you. I love when I feel close to you. I love when I'm struggling and I know that you're here with me. Do we express our love for our Father? Little children do. The seventh point, final point today, is that a little child is totally dependent on their, on their parents. Totally dependent on their parents. And the thing is, they don't, they don't mind it. They don't think it's unusual. They don't think it's a weakness to be totally dependent on their parent. They're okay with it. They're fine with being dependent. They don't think it makes them smaller somehow, less somehow because they're dependent on their parent. Turn to Matthew. We have a few chap verses we'll go through. Through scriptures we'll go through here at the end. Matthew chapter 11. Begin in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all of you who labor, who carry a heavy load, and I'll give you rest. Take up, take my yoke and learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly of heart. If you do that, you will find rest. You will find support. You will find help 
for my burden is easy and it's and or my yoke is easy and my burden is light he says let me carry your burdens let me help you don't do it all on your own trust in me james chapter 1 James 1, verse 17. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above, comes down from the Father of lights. And he doesn't vary. He doesn't turn away. He wants to give gifts. He gives us gifts. Every good thing in our life comes from him. And then one final scripture in 2 Peter, chapter 1. Second Peter, chapter 1, and verse 3. Well, we can, let's just start in verse 1. It's got a lot, a lot of good things to say in there. Verse 1, 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith, another something, uh, precious faith, I think we've heard about that, have obtained that by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as our Father's divine power has given us everything, that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who calls us by glory and virtue. Everything that is good, everything that pertains to eternal life comes from God. The only way is for us to be dependent on him. It's the only way to continue, only way to be in God's kingdom, only way to be in his family is to be dependent on our Father. The only way we can be truly successful in life, in this life, in spiritual, our spiritual life, and the only path to eternal life is through him. So how dependent are you? Again, that's an individual answer. Each one of us are different. Each one of us are probably more or less dependent in different areas of our life. But how dependent? Are we like a young child in our level of dependency on God the Father? The Bible says that there is great value in having a childlike attitude. The Bible says, Christ said, that it's a requirement for eternal life. A requirement to see the kingdom of God. It's important. And Christ knew that, just like so many of the examples that he gave, if we thought about what a child was like and we applied that on the, the spiritual level, it would lead us to a closer relationship. He recognized that, that the example of a little child would carry weight with everyone. And it would be an example that we all could understand. If we think about our relationship, our spiritual life, from this aspect, I think we'll all find areas of our areas where we need to do better, where we can do better, where we are not childlike. Certainly that's the reason that I'm giving this message, is be, and, and it's the reason that I came across this is because I need to develop, and I need to work on this. And I need to be more dependent than I am because I'm not, the carnal side of me is not a dependent person. The carnal side of me is, I can just take care of this myself. I'm smart. I have skills. I can do this. And I have a lot of that to continue to wash out of myself. 
Christ told us to be like children and not in a superficial way, but with depth. That at our heart and at our core, we had a childlike relationship with our father. We've looked at some of the ways that that can happen. I think as we look at this individually, there's probably other areas where you can identify that you need to work as well. But as we approach the spring holy days, as we are examining ourselves, let's make part of that examination a, a, a critical look at ourselves and whether we have truly the childlike attitude that God is asking us to have 